Afternoon, ladies and gents. Matt McNeil here with a different idea for this week's episode. So just stay with me. Follow this uh, train of thought that I've been kind of riding on. Life gets pretty crazy. Mine got really crazy the last couple of weeks. Whether it's the holidays, whether it's your work, maybe it's your kids' school homework that they forgot to do. It's kind of a regular uh, occurrence around here. You know, 10 o'clock the night before, oh, I didn't do my homework, got to get it done. Meal prepping, everything, anything, it doesn't matter. Life's happenings can make us feel pretty overwhelmed. It happens to everyone, it happens to the best of us. And there are tools, activities, and skills that we can do to rebalance, reorient, calm our mind and body. These skills are meant to be talked about. They're not a, a one-time fix-it-all kind of thing. It's a practice. Practice leads to mastery. So with that in mind, I want to go back into the, into the vault, if you will, and reintroduce an episode from about a year ago, almost exactly a year episode 14, which was called Loss, Overwhelm, Ways Out, and Ways Through. One year ago, Carl and I talked about loss and grief, and then all the ways out and through being overwhelmed. Remember to keep practicing at it, and life gets easier. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Lift Effect podcast. I am your host, Matt McNeil, founder, clinical director, and director of human performance at Lift Effect where we assist professional pilots with maintaining better mental health and optimizing their mental skills. The goal of this podcast is simple, to help pilots and other high liability professionals and disciplines come out of the shadows to discover how we can live better lives personally and professionally. Join us each episode as we discuss various topics ranging from mental health, mental skills and performance, to business, entrepreneurship, and a few other surprises along the way. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another Lift Effect podcast. We've talked about a lot of things so far. I have so many more things to talk about. But uh, I would like to tell our listeners today that this could be a, 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 an interesting or, or challenging podcast because we're going to talk about some things that are, are, are very challenging. Because um, it, it, it ties into a question that was asked of us and also of what has to be dealt with at times or de- or, or the things that you deal with and the challenges. Um, I'm Carl Keller. I'm the host. And with me is, as always, Matt McNeil, the uh, founder of Lift Effect, who, uh, as, as many of you already know, uh, specializes in dealing with um, um, helping people in the aviation industry and others that are in high stress, high performance types of professions. Um, this is gonna be probably one of the more somber and probably serious conversations we've had. Um, and like I said, uh, the question that we got kind of leads into everything that's going on right now. Um, first of all, I'm gonna say, Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing okay, man. I'm doing all right. It's been a, it's been kind of a rough couple of days um, as, you know, not not all days are great, but things are things are okay. Well, I'll get right to it. And and like I said, this question really kind of leads into what's what's been going on, and uh, that is, uh, the listener asked, what are some of the more challenging aspects of what you do? Timely question. Yeah, unfor- um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, and yeah. and how do you deal with those things? Yeah. Kind of a so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's such a broad question. Um, so one of the, I guess, just to kind of like let people know, you know, one of the things that happens when you work in the this field is um, you can't save everybody. Um, then I certainly, I don't save anybody. I help people save themselves. But, uh, you know, sometimes people, people can't, they can't keep going. And um, we lost somebody uh, that, that, uh, we've worked with, I've worked with, um, uh, to suicide. They ended up reaching, I think a point where they, they couldn't continue to, to push on. And, um, 
and took their life. And we just, I just got notified of that yesterday. So it's, it's always hard. I mean, that's one of the things that, that goes with this. If you do this long enough, and I think in aviation or in medicine, you know, you're going to lose people, um, with flying, uh, I've lost several people to aviation accidents. Um, certainly the ones that are out GA flying, not, not airlines, never lost anybody to an airline accident because there's so few of those, but GA, there's a lot of them. And, um, certainly I'm sure you can, in the military, you lose people. Uh, in my squadron, I've lost four. Yeah. Four people that I flew with. There were two that I was, I knew pretty well. And the other two tangentially, but yeah, four. So it's going to happen. I mean, life is not a, a perfect, uh, Something's going to get you, as they say. Um, but the suicide stuff is hard. I think that's one of the harder parts of my job is when somebody loses the will to live and they they take their own life. And it it there's a lot of different questions around that. Is like what is the right that somebody has to their own life? Um, you know, I, I firmly believe you know the way that we treat animals um, that we love. Uh, I mean, Gandhi always had a quote, you can tell a, a, how a society is based on how they treat their animals. That is really true. Um, you know, w- animals that you love, we, we, we really show them mercy and we will, we'll, we'll put them out of their misery, but with people, we, we, we kind of don't, if you, if you look at how we handle medicine is, is like, you know, just keep people going no matter what, uh, just keep them alive because our collective view of death is so like we're so averse to it um and in medicine and we can talk to our physician listeners and nurses and and emts and you know medical medical workers but there's this you know at some point you say what what the hell are we doing like what are we what are we doing here and that's why hospice uh uh doctors and nurses are such amazing people because their their view of of mercy is, is very different, I think, than the rest of the medical community. But, um, but when people take their own life, that's, it's, I think it's very easy for us to say, that's just terrible. You know, that's like the worst thing. Um, and it, it does, it's the worst thing I think for others often, but sometimes it's not the worst thing for that person. Um, because that person is suffering pain so much pain just in so much pain um that the will to to and this is victor frankel's work kind of back to frankel is that will to live the will the meaning when you don't have meaning in the suffering and it just becomes fruitless you know it becomes untenable for people and this particular person i had known and really cared for um had some very debilitating challenges that we're not going to get better. And um, you never want to get that call. It's, it's, you, you never want to get that call, but you, but you do get it. And it's, it's never easy. It, it never gets easier. It's not like you get used to it. I don't ever get used to it. And honestly, I don't ever want to get used to it. And I think the the loss that I'm feeling is um i'm feeling for this person's family their loss and i'm feeling for all that this person lost in their life because of um their mental health issues that was to no fault of their own um loss of career loss of identity loss of family loss of everything and there's so much loss and it just it 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 breaks my heart and i i hope that i know that 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 pain is now gone for this person and so there's some relief in that but i'm heartbroken and i'm really sad about that and so how do you deal what what's hard about this profession is loss is you want i I want to just be able to help everybody and i give everything i have with with my clients when i put everything i have into it i don't hold anything back and um it's not a sense of failure i think you know when i was younger you know you lose people you feel like you failed i don't feel that way but it's it's just just profound sadness 
um, that this person is gone and I will deeply miss this person very much, miss our conversations. And I, I remember the last year of my mother's life uh, for um, almost five months, I was a full-time caregiver. It was the hardest, mm -hmm. uh, most challenging, mentally um, challenging period of my life. Um, she needed 24 seven. I was up all night with her. And then during the day I'd be with the kids and everything. She had, she was at peace with, with, she was ready. She kept saying, I'm ready to go. Uh, she was a survivor of world war two. Wow. Um, she'd been over in the bombings and, um, she was five foot nine, came out weighing less than 70 pounds when the war was over. And I always thought that, you know, it's, she's not going to survive just because of the physical stress that that, that kind of life, uh, you know, puts on you. But she had the constitution like you wouldn't believe. Hmm. Her, the mind was ready to let go, but the body wasn't. And it just kept going and going. But it was so hard to watch that. And um, forgive me for being so if this sounds cold, my, my mother kept having what, what I call these dead cat bounces mm -hmm. where she thought she was ready to go and everybody would say their goodbyes. And then she would make this miraculous recovery and sometimes even be cogent because she had dementia and, and just, mm -hmm. there was times she thought I was a robber and was trying mm -hmm. to rob and steal and do other nefarious things to mm -hmm. her. But she'd have these moments of clarity where she'd recognize everybody and you kept going and the hope springs eternal. And then, but each mm -hmm. bounce, so to speak, the highs were lower and lower and lower. And, um, and my family was going through a lot just because how many times do you tell your little, my little kids to say goodbye to Oma, grandma. Um, but it, it's hard. Loss is hard. And, and, it, and it, she was at peace mm -hmm. or at least what, what, what mental faculties she had, she was at peace but while she still had them. She was just in a lot of pain. And that was another thing. I think when you'd mentioned hospice, I didn't really understand hospice at first. Mm -hmm. Hospice isn't there for you to get better. No, hospice is there no. to manage pain yeah. for people. So allow you they, to transition. They, yeah. To transition out. They're, they're already there to help you. I can't say they're assisted suicide. That's not what it is. But they're there no. to assist your, your, your suffering, knowing that your, that your time on this physical earth is, mm -hmm. is nearing an end or at the end. Mm -hmm. So it was, a it was, a, it, it was a very, my, my respect for people that are in that profession is immense because I know I couldn't do it because I don't know how I, the, the, the ability to be remain objective or be too mm -hmm. close to somebody to empathize. I don't know if I'd be able to find that balance. And that's yeah. one of the things I've always, when talking to you, I've always said, how do you find that balance to be able to sit there and help the people and be objective enough so that you don't lose a part of you, but yet still have the empathy to be able to care about those people uh, that you're you're helping. That is like a, the same with caregivers I give you. It's I, I can't, I don't know that I could do it and maintain that balance. Well, and I think that was part of the question was, how do you do that? Because yeah, I, I here's, here's, that's a good question. I mean, it's funny. Like you look at the burnout rate of psychotherapists and it's like massive. It's, it's I gotta believe, you know, it. I look at my, my cohort uh, from graduate school that graduated and there's like six, 17 of us, 17 of us. And I think like there's only three of us that are still practicing. And how long ago was that? Um, I don't know, 14 years ago, something like that. I mean, it's they Not like even 15 they, years and you're 20%, less than 20%. Yeah. 12 years. Yeah. Uh, and, and you got to get full licensure, which takes a couple of years. So if you think about it, like they've actually been eligible to be fully, you know, licensed practicing independently, like 10, 12 years. Uh, and like most of them have moved into <laughs> academic positions, research positions at universities. So they're not um, dealing with patients on a day-to-day -day They're basis. not treating patients, no. And there's only like a, a couple of us. Hey, Brian, if you're listening, keep going, brother. Um, but like there's only a few of us that are doing it. And uh, because the burnout rate is so high. And what's the common factor among the few of us that are still doing it is, is 
you know, like Brian um, works for the vet center. He's a, he was a Marine in Iraq, got blown VA. up. So yeah. He VA. works at the, well, it's, it's a part of the, it's an offshoot of the VA. He works for the vet center and uh, I think he's still in Minneapolis, but uh, you know, but he's, he's mission oriented and I'm mission oriented. Like it's my, my work isn't about me. It's about my clients. It's about the mission. It's about trying to change an industry, trying to change a culture. So the way I can just keep going, and I do a lot of, I mean, most therapists, you know, work 15 hours a week of psychotherapy and they're done. They don't want to do any more. And I do like 40, you know, I mean, I just, I, I, I think I do it because I don't, it's not about me. So I, I just can focus on trying to bring the, the most help and the most care for my clients. And I, I don't really think about me now. Is there a price to pay? Yeah, there's a, there's a physical price that, that is, a, there's a toll. It's just like flying airplanes. There's it, it, it's going to take a toll on you. You know, a lot of radiation, a lot of sleep issues, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, you already had, you had to, um, shed some of stuff already. I mean, you used to be an airline pilot. You were doing yep. that. You had to let go of that. I yep. think you were, you were, you were in management dealing with similar things. You had to let that go. Yep. Um, I mean, you still have, you have a family. You yeah. Have a, you got you to prioritize. Yeah. Yeah. You I, side business coaching. Yep. And now doing a podcast is no, no simple talk. No, and let go. The, so there's a, a lot you, of work. You, yeah. You have a huge full plate. I do. And I got a good team of people like you and Bree and people that, that help me. Uh, do this. You can't do this on your own. And V1 project is the next thing. And, you know, but you can't do it on your own. So you got to have a good team of people. You got to, you got to share the the responsibility and the love um, with the right people. Um, and I, that's something I've had to learn is, you know, you just, you want to do it all on your own, just do it, do it, do it. And then you realize I can't do this all on my own. I need to surround myself with, you know, people that, that are, are on board with the mission. It's, but it's not about me. It's about the mission. It's about what we're trying to do. Here's the question that I would want to ask you then. Obviously, the goal of this podcast is to help others. Yeah. And today, a lot, so far, we've been doing a lot of talking about you. And that was what the question was about. Mm. But these are things that people deal with when their plate gets so full yeah. with, uh, with life. It's just life, whether it, it could be job, it could be relationships, it could be money. It doesn't make a difference what it is. The plate gets full or the bucket gets full. And when it's full, you can pour more water and more stuff into it. It's just going to flow. So the question I would ask you that would help others mm -hmm. potentially is what tools do you use that, that and not that anybody else may use those, but give an idea of what kind of tools do you use to help you manage when chaos and the noise gets so loud and you mentioned one bre recently about taking the, the 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 three or four deep breaths to kind of slow things down i think that's one of the tools you used uh are there any others that you could that you use or could recommend i firmly believe in in using tools that cultivate uh flexibility psychological flexibility and as you know there's psychological flexibility skills that we can cultivate that's what the the mental skills for value-based living workshop is for that we do at lift effect is to cultivate psychological flexibility when we feel internal states of distress or overwhelm uh or um you know just strife there's tools so one of the things is that i work on is is just being able to when the stress is really heavy um obviously 80 20 right i mean like Okay, here, like I'm holding up the productivity planner. It's like choose the most important tasks, get rid of the get rid of the other ones. Not everything is important. If everything is important, nothing's important. Um, and so being able to <clears throat> pare down and whittle down what is the most important thing and just focus on that. And then the secondary and then the additional after that. So that's a way to kind of get things off the plate. But when things are just hot and heavy in a bad way, and you're just like you can feel like you're at the boiling point. I work at trying to get back to the present moment. Like, because when I'm overstressed is usually I'm thinking about all that is, that needs to be done. 
and it feels overwhelming or I'm thinking I may even start past tensing about, you know, my shortcomings. You know, when we get vulnerable, we get down on ourselves. And so being able to tether back into the present moment is the equivalent of for the pilots out there is like looking at the attitude indicator instead of just looking at all the other instrumentation. It's like you get lost, get turned topsy turvy, lose your way, get the spins. You you the your eyes need to go to that attitude indicator a hundred percent. in the gyro. Yeah. Yep. So the present moment is the attitude indicator is like, okay, w- my life is happening in real time in this moment. And in this moment, am I, am I safe? Usually I am. Usually I am. Uh, if I'm not, which is very rare, then I need to get myself into some place of, you know, some safety, uh, which is like, if you're in a, you know, uh, a car with screaming kids and, you know, this and that, it's like, you're not going to solve it necessarily in the car. You need to get yourself out of the car and, and then, you know, find a place to return to. But the present moment is, is where your life is actually happening. And in the present moment, it's okay. So what do you do? How do you do that? Ground yourself into, um, something that is a constant and, one of the things that's always a constant, and if you practice a cultivate a practice of mindfulness, um, which is mind training, the constant that, that is usually focused on is the breath. The breath is this constant companion that that never goes away. If you don't think it is, try holding your breath for a while and 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 don't, you know, see what happens. You'll see how important the breath is really fast. So the the constant companion is 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 the breath. And if you just focus on the sensation, like we have five senses, touch, taste, sight, smell, sound, those are real time, real information, sensory experiences. Those are in the moment. Like if you, if you touch your hand on your cheek and you can feel that, that's, a, that's happening in, in, in real time. It's not future tensed or past tensed. It's, re, it's present. So grounding yourself into a physiological sensation of breathing, which is where do you feel the sensation of breathing? in that moment, maybe it's the tip of your nose or the back of your throat, or it's in your chest or your belly, but just being able to like focus your attention on that sensation is a way to start to refocus your energy into the present moment and getting out of that like complete and total overwhelm. One of the tools that we use and that we teach, um, is a tool that, uh, Lots of people have written about it. I think the best synthesis is by a guy named Russ Harris. He he wrote about it. He calls it dropping anchor, and it's just a it's a it's a technique to to contact the present moment to get to the attitude indicator, and when it, it's good for overwhelm. So what does overwhelm mean? Maybe we should talk about that for a second. Overwhelm is like emotional dysregulation <laughs> when you're losing your shit, you're becoming dysregulated. That's overwhelm. Being hyper aroused, you know, like looking for the tiger constantly. You feel like that spidey sense is just, you know, 10x. That, you're t- that adrenaline where the adrenaline's got adrenaline. you. So you're so hyper, you it's like you can't. Yeah. yeah. Hi, now there's there's hypo arousal, which is the opposite. When you're completely lethargic and just zonked, you know, that we call that dissociation. That's a protective mechanism as well. Like just check out. And even it's at its most, you know, extreme state is people just, they, they, they just sleep. They just pass out. They're just out. I almost feel like that's when people drink too much and they just. Well, they're trying to dissociate. I mean, they're trying to use a chemical to get into that place, but, but we can even, when people get overwhelmed, they used to call it shell shock. Remember that, that term shell shock. Oh yeah. People standing there, not just with not, not able to move. That's a protective state. Um, That's, that's the, that's the freeze state freeze, fight, run. Um, so dissociation is a, a big one. Overwhelming emotions, you know, like just extreme fits of screaming or yelling or crying is when we are are, are overwhelmed. Uh, when your behavior becomes more compulsive, that's a good sign of overwhelm. Like you start to just become more compulsively regimented about something. Um, and not know why sometimes. And not know why. You're just like, why am I getting so wrapped around the axle about this being a certain way? Um, extreme fusion to your thoughts. Like you just can't get, you know, you, you, 
every thought becomes totally consuming and overwhelming. You just no no perspective that maybe you're just experiencing the thought instead of of uh, you know becoming the thought. Flashbacks can be a sign of overwhelm. Panic attacks. So the the point is is like there's there's three steps that Harris writes about dropping anchor, and he uses the the term ACE. ACE. So for the pilots, that's easy. You're an ACE, right? Um, A is acknowledge your inner experience. So the aim here is to just like acknowledge whatever thoughts, feelings, emotions, sensations, memories, urges, whatever, whatever's present. And it's often useful to just put into the words like, okay, here's sadness. Here's anger. Here's worry. Here's confusion whatever is is happening or he, you know here's tension c is come back into your body this is the grounding piece this is the recage piece and it's just to regain a sense of self control by focusing on what you have most control over when difficult thoughts and feelings uh are, are there which is your your physical reactions you can't control your mind you can't control what you think about don't think about that. That's always the funniest advice that you know coaches give you and stuff like that is don't think about that. Like you can't not think, you can't control your thoughts. You, you don't get to control what you think. And it's actually paradoxical. The more you try to control it, the, the more out of control it gets. So using your body is one thing you can control. So like people say, no, you can't. Yes, you can. Put your hand over your head, right? Just do it. Whoever's listening, put your hand over your head. Well, how did you do that? Well, you just did it because you can control that. You can't control your heart rate, your autonomic response. You can't control your, you know, dilation or your your how much you you perspire. That's those are autonomic nervous system responses. You have very little control over that, but your musculoskeletal nervous system, which is your muscle metabolism, your level of muscle tension, you do have control over that. Um, and for all you listeners out there, say that by running you can elevate your heartbeat. Yeah, you can, but that's cheap. right. You you can do that. <laughs> but if I said take your heart rate, and look, some people have trained themselves, like Wim Hof and all those guys, like they train themselves to do this. But the average person th does not. They can't just take their heart rate from sixty to to one hundred and fifty just sitting there. You could try yeah. to think about something that's distressing, um, you know. But but you have very little control over that. But in terms of like, if you're holding tension in your jaw, you can go, oh, I'm going to relax my jaw. Like you can control the musculoskeletal skeletal nervous system. You don't get to control the autonomic nervous system. But what's cool is when you start to, to relax the muscle, if you think about adrenaline, right? What, what happens? We get scared and the brain goes, okay, I need to either freeze, fight, or run from the tiger. So it, it, it goes, okay, adrenaline pumps on, shoots adrenaline. Now the adrenaline innervates into your body and it, and it goes into the muscles. All the blood drains from your organs and goes out to your muscles. So you can try to neutralize the threat, which is run or fight or freeze, uh, which is great for a bit. But if you do that for too long, like you're going to die because your organs need blood. So the adrenaline in the brain talks to the body. It goes, okay, let's go. Let's, you need super strength to lift the car off the kid or whatever it is. That's a good thing. But if you can then relax the muscle, even if the brain is going nuts saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, right? Overwhelm. If you say, if you say, you know what, I'm going to try to relax my, my, my jaw or relax my shoulders and just let my body become relaxed with my muscles. What happens is, is it sends a signal back to the brain that says, I don't need adrenaline. There's no stress here, even with the thoughts going, going crazy. So the, so the brain goes, oh, okay, adrenaline pumps off. So the brain talks to the body, but see, the body gets to talk back to the brain. So that's why being able to come back into your body is, is really important. You're, and so move, stretch, change posture, sit upright, stand up, walk, alter your breathing, straighten your spine push your feet into the floor, whatever it is, right? These things help people to rapidly regain control over the physical body, which starts to then communicate with the brain. So that's the C, I, what are you going to say? I was going to say, I remember one of my instructors when I was learning how to fly, when I, you know, whenever you would see people tense up on the, on the, on the controls with their hands, mm. they always would say, wiggle your toes. 
Try try to keep your hands tense and wiggle your toes at the same time. It starts to relax it. Yeah, it starts it, it, to relax. It's really cool. It, yeah, it is. Yeah, when, when we would do, I ran a fear of flying, uh, helped co-run a fear of flying treatment program where we'd get all these phobics and go on a commercial flight, which people would be like, that's insane. No, we could do it because we could cure it. But we would say is, listen, you get to be as upset and anxious and freaked out as you want, but you have to keep your muscles relaxed while you're doing it. And if you just relax, and so we just go with the arm, right? Just relax. And I would walk up and down the, the aisle and I would, I would lift their arm by their sleeve, right? And if the arm just went up, I'd be like, nah, you're not relaxed, right? You need to get that arm really heavy. So when I pull on your sleeve, the arm is just really like, it's really limp. And so if they did that within 12 minutes, the number one thing they would report is, well, this is so weird. I should be totally freaking out right now but I'm not right because you allowed your physiological body, your, your, the, the, your musculoskeletal nervous system to communicate with your brain to start to downregulate your autonomic nervous system. It's the two way communication. They talk to each other. So coming back into your body is this, it's a great step toward any effective physical action. And then the E is engage with the world. So the aim here is to expand your awareness. Notice where you are. What are you doing? What can you see, hear, touch, taste, smell? And it's not to distract from your thoughts and feelings, but to notice what else is here in addition to your thoughts and feelings. Because when we're overwhelmed, we're so in it that that's like the only thing that we, that we feel. We're like drowning in the overwhelm and being able to use your sensations to go, okay, th that's there, but there's also more stuff here gives you a little bit more perspective, um, which is a something we call psychological diffusion. So acknowledge your inner experience, come back into your body, engage with the world. It's sort of like when you're taxing around and, and you're getting conflicting information from controllers, you don't just keep taxiing, you stop. What do you do? Set the brake. Okay, wait, time out, time out. Or they change the runways, right? Just, okay, stop, set the brake, reprogram your stuff, Make sure you get everything in there and, and then you can, you know, re-engage with Just what's like going if there's on. an emergency on an airplane, hack the clock. Hack the clock. You know, That's give it. yourself, you know, because if you, so some things have to be, uh, uh, you know, you just do automatically, but there's so many things that you need to take a second or two, analyze things, calm yourself down. And, and it's amazing right. what the difference is in just those few seconds. Yeah. Um, I think I've told you before, and I think I've said it on one of the podcasts, one of the things that I use all the time is I use the okay symbol where you have the circle and I look through it and I go, I can only see so many things in it, and that's life. Life wants to make you go down that rabbit hole, whether it's money, relationships, uh, a job, it doesn't make a difference. And I constantly am forcing it open to, I make an L. So I, I say, I want my picture to be so big. I can only see one corner yeah. to remind myself that all that stress there life wants to do that to you and you have to open them and go how blessed you really are and how fortunate mm -hmm. you are. And that helps me deescalate things because I realize I'm, you know, I have a, a wife who loves me and that I love and I have five healthy children and that helps me kind of deescalate things and put things in perspective. And that's the word I, I think that's so important is when you get in that, in, in, not in flying, I'm going to take flying away from this for a minute and put it in life's perspective Life is, life wants to drag you down the hole and, it, and it's all about perspective, trying to find out what's really important because so often we lose that and we think that that little problem becomes the only thing in life that matters, mm -hmm. that drags you down. Finances, you know, uh, finances is a challenging thing for so many people out there today, yeah. but you know what? We can all get another job and there are people that live on a lot less than most of our listeners do yeah. based on the demographics of what we have. It's well, amazing it, what we can do when we just focus on those it, things. It's true. And and it's funny when you look at, and there is not, this is look, there are people that do not have enough and they are, you know, and that is a serious problem for people. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like there is economic hardship, you know, p people have, most of the world is incredibly poor. Um, but it's funny when I work with, with our clientele is you, you know, people that are, are higher income earners. Um, it's amazing the psychological place they can get into where they feel like they have nothing. 
And when you, so one of the things I do, and one of the things we're going to do it like in the V1 project is the fi- financial garden is one of the, one of the constellations that we work on is what is your relationship with finances? What are your attitudes about money? Is it scarcity? Is it abundance? And, and how much do you actually need? Most people think that I just need more and more and more. And as pilots, you know, we're like, I, they'll work themselves to death picking up extra time and picking up more trips and go, 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 go to make more money. And it's like, but why are you doing that? Well, I just need it. Well, how much do you need? Well, I just need more. Well, that's absurd. And so figuring out what you actually need, when you take people down that exercise, which I've done many, many times, which is get your financial planner involved and get your wife involved or your spouse, your husband or the, your, your partner. Um, and you know, like, like, let's actually look at your budget and let's actually look at what you need. It's always way less than what they thought. You know, they thought they needed all of this, you know, I I just need more and more. And it's like a fraction in, in, in actual terms of what do you need? It's a fraction of what they thought. And so our, our mindset is, is typically because of freeze fight or run goes into lack. And that, that can really create a lot of problems a lot of problems for people. So I don't know how we ended up getting into that, but. Well, it's all about coping and dealing with stress and dealing with all all those things we've talked about today. And I was going to tie that all up because people may go, how did, how did all of that have to do with loss? (laughs) I don't know. It's all about coping and dealing with things sometimes that are not in our control. I mean, uh, some things are, some things we have self-imposed upon ourselves or, or done to ourselves, you know, made a bad financial decision. As an example, that you know, we can sit there and say, "Yeah, I did that to myself," but what happened to my mom isn't anything that I did. That's, that's and it's a normal it's part of life. living. Yeah, it like lo- losses. You, you you don't get to get out of. Look, my mom always used to say, "You don't get something without giving something else up," and so you know, maybe it's that you know, have your cake and eat it too kind of thing. But like, life is a zero sum game. Normal. Unfortunately, it, yeah, it's you're gonna lose. You're going to lose one of my good, really good friends just lost his dad. Um, his dad was loved AME, like just a beloved AME guy lived to be 98. Amazing life. And he was telling me one of the things his dad had said shortly before he died is he said, you know, I've lost everything. I lost my mom, lost my dad, lost my brother, lost my practice. I, I mean, loss is if you're lucky in some respects, if we're lucky, we get to go through that. It is so hard to get, maintain that perspective, but I keep telling myself, Oh, it's very difficult. I, you know, I hate to say it like this. This is a very morbid, but just a real thing to say. We start dying the moment we're born. It's true. So we will live, we are born and we will die. Yep. And life doesn't change. And unfortunately, since we're a, What's changed is 200 years ago, the average life expectancy was in the 30s and 40s for the majority yeah, of the people, yeah. and and death was a very common. It was it was a constant companion. I hate to say it. We've we've come to the point where you know we say uh, we should uh, a parent should never outlive their child. Mm-hmm. Well, back in those days, parents outlived their children all the, all time. the time. But in it's, today's it's world, true. it's we have to look at okay, that's that was then. This is now. And what I say is it's it's what you do between the time you're born and you and and life ends. It's that journey. And and yeah, you may lose things along the way, but you gain things too. Yeah. And it's the experiences and it's it's the feelings. And I've always I've always said as an example, you know, when somebody says, Well, when you die, that's it. And I said, No, no one's ever, you know, as long as they're in my heart, they're not dead. Yeah. They're not gone. Yeah. Well, so, we don't know either. I mean, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know like, we don't what's know on what, the other we, side. We, we don't understand or, consciousness and and all that stuff. I mean, we. I, I think I've got my own thoughts on that. But yeah, we're, I'm just talking about the know. physical. Yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. It's but it is hard. It's really it's really hard. And um, I think it takes a lot. It just takes constant awareness and constant work and openness. And I'll say, let me just add this one thing about dropping anchor. Emotional overwhelm is is there in some respects to get your attention 
So it's not just about like, let me just get rid of the symptoms, get rid of like, so for example, when people are grieving and they cry, they go, I don't want to cry. I want, well, crying is actually a normal, healthy, adaptive oh, God, yes. emotion to express. You actually want to do that. Um, and even aggression in an adaptive way, like I just, I'm going to go hit the punching bag or I'm going to go punch the pillow to uh, release some of this. And I'm not going to hurt anybody in the process. I'm like, yes, go for it. Don't suppress emotions. That's not the goal is to suppress. So Keep it's it okay inside to, and one yeah. day, uh, it, the way it comes pop, out will be man. much worse. It's going to pop. Much worse. Yep. So it's not a, a, a sub it's, we're not trying to avoid emotions or avoid those warning signs that overwhelm can give us, which is, Hey, hold on. You're getting overwhelmed. It's, it's to pay attention. That's the goal is pay attention and then decide what the correct course of action is. Well, I'm going to throw you a softball that we need to say this, I think. And that is, I think we all at some point in our lives reach that point where we don't know where to go and what to do. Fortunately for so many of us, we have loved ones, but yeah. make sure that don't ever feel like you have nowhere to turn. Yeah. If you feel like you have nowhere to turn, you're wrong. Please talk to someone, get help. There's, I mean, there's even a toll free numbers out there that you yeah, can just go dial, to. dial 988. Uh, and, and that that's a way to speak with somebody. The suicide hotline, is uh 800-273-8255. You know, like if, if if you feel like you're at the end, you know, um please don't feel like you're alone. You're you don't have yeah. to be. And if you are alone, you know, you, it's good to reach out. So yeah, reach out and call, you know, just it th th you can't do this on your own. We weren't meant to do this on our own. No. We are social creatures. We're not meant to live alone and to be a hermit in a cave. It's just that's not how we were built and designed. Um, although sometimes I think we act like we can do it all by ourselves. Well, that's our society too, is to yeah. do is, is very individualistic. A lot of other societies are much more community oriented. And so we, we just want to be lone wolves and think we should just tough it out on our own. And I'll just tell you, toughen it out. There's some like utility in that, but there's a point where that becomes really stupid and, and, and your ego gets in the way and it's dumb. You don't have to do that. Just reach ego out. Ego and pride are two of the most dangerous things that I think historically men face. Ooh, we're going to have to talk about that one at some point. Oh, <laughs> we'll yes, we get will. get into ego and pride. We're yeah. going to get a lot of emails about that. But <laughs> but anyways, I just, but, I, you know, th this was, um, I appreciate the listeners maybe hanging with this episode. It was kind of kind of an, a different one for us. Um, I was kind of heavy when we got on the call and, and you know, before we started the, uh, started recording and Carl sort of tapped in and was like, Hey, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that. And I was like, oh, I don't know, but, but I think it was good. We didn't really follow an agenda today, but um, hopefully it was useful. Hope people get something out of it. The one thing I would want to say, and we wait until the very end to say it is that you're not alone. And this is something we all deal with. You know, we sometimes feel like, Oh, th no one knows what we feel or what I'm feeling. And I have nowhere to go because no one will understand. And, it's just me alone. You're not. For those that are are in a place where they don't have anybody, they still have places to turn. It's just, it's it's not the fun part of life that we want to talk about, but it's part of life, and we just need to make sure, like Matt had given, there's tools and there's places for us to go to to get us through those those times until we get to to God willing for most of us a better place. So, any last thoughts, Matt? Everybody take care of yourself out there. Go love your loved ones. Uh, if you've got them, if you don't just go have a conversation with somebody, even at the grocery store, just connect with somebody, just look in somebody's eyes and feel that connection, that human connection that's innate and that we've got. There's, there's ways to connect if you're willing to, and if you just show up, people need it. I mean, it's amazing when you just talk to somebody and just look at them in their eyes, it's, they're not used to that. You know, even at the grocery store, it's like, oh, wow, there's actually somebody was just kind to me. Somebody acknowledged me. It goes a long, long way. And I think, you know, do do a little bit a lot. Don't try to do a lot a little. Just go connect. Just go have a, a meaningful, um, even just saying hello to somebody is is deeply meaningful. And you never know. That might just like 
help somebody in ways that's that is profound that you'll never be aware of as always we thank you for listening please keep the questions coming podcast at lifteffect.com and also please give us a like thumbs up keep spreading the word of our podcast there are so many people that this is how they find out about us and we appreciate you supporting us by letting other people know about this so that we can touch and help people that as matt says we may never ever know that we've helped them but that's what this is all about is giving people tools and ways to reach out and find that that help when they need it thank you again for being a part of this today and we look forward to seeing you on our next podcast have a great day Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Lift Effect Podcast. If you want to dive deeper into this episode and every episode, go to the Lift Effect Podcast.podbean. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com. If you're enjoying the show, we would love it if you'd follow us on Spotify and rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate your support. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, all with the ID Matthew McNeil. This show is brought to you by Lift Effect, a clinical mental health and consulting company that assists air carriers, corporate flight departments, pilot unions, and commercial pilots at providing comprehensive psychotherapy and mental coaching services to pilots with mental health and mental performance-related issues. Visit lifteffect.com, that's L-I-F-T-A-F-F-E-C-T.com to book your free consultation. And finally, this podcast is for general informational purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of counseling, psychotherapy, medicine, or any other healthcare service, including the giving of medical advice. No therapeutic or provider-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and any materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional psychological advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining advice for any psychological or medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on the Lift Effect Podcast.